protein digestion. Proteins we know are macromolecules and they must be broken down into smaller components known as amino acids. So in order to break them into smaller components, we will need the help of enzymes. To be more specific, we need enzymes called proteolytic enzymes. Proteo refers to protein and lytic refers to breakdown. So these enzymes will basically break down these protein macromolecules. And these usually takes place in different parts of our bodies, especially in the stomach, pancreas, and in the small intestine. So how they are digested? Let's see. They will be broken down by certain enzymes called peptidases or proteases. Now these peptidases or proteases are of two kinds. Number one is endopeptidases. These are usually found in enzyme or these are usually enzymes such as pepsin, trypsin, chymotrypsin. They are mainly produced in the stomach and in the pancreas. Their role is to mainly break down the bonds between peptides and break them into smaller parts. The second kind of enzymes we have are called exopeptidases. Their, their role is to remove the amino group Okay, remove the amino acids from the amino, uh, the, amino, uh, the amino terminal and also the carboxyl terminal. Now, number one is important to break down the larger one into smaller one. And once the breakdown is done, then the second one, exopipidase, attacks on them. The digestion itself can be divided into three stages. One is called gastric stage, the second one is called pancreatic stage, and the third one is called the intestinal stage. Let's see what happens during these stages. In the gastric phase or gastric stage, usually represents, as you can see here, 15% of protein digestion. So basically in the stomach, this will take place, where we have an inactive form of enzyme called pepsinogen. So we know that our stomach has hydrochloric acid. So under hydrochloric acid or in, under acidic environment, the pepsinogen becomes activated and converts into pepsin. Now this pepsin, that enzyme that we have is our endopeptidase. This will act on protein and break down them into polypeptide and amino acids. In infants who have a milk diet, they also have a special enzyme that is released in them. It's called renin. This one is specifically for digesting the milk protein called casein. In adults, you may not find this. The second phase that we have, the pancreatic phase of protein digestion. Now, after the gastric phase have ended, okay, next one, the pancreatic phase will begin. During this phase, usually the enzymes such as trypsin, chymotrypsin and elastase, these enzymes will basically act on the protein and ultimately will convert them into free amino acids and small peptides. The third phase is the intestinal phases. And during these phases, basically the exopeptidase will come into action. Okay, they will either attack the carboxyl end or the amino end of the protein. They will separate the amino acids. Okay, ultimately the product is amino acids, tripeptides and tripeptides. Now once the breakdown has occurred, the digestion is completed, the next phase that comes is protein absorption. Most of the amino acids that we have are in the form of L amino acids. Now, L amino acids are absorbed via the intestinal wall or intestinal mucosa by the process of active transport with the help of carrier proteins and sodium potassium pump. For different types of amino acids, we have different carrier transport mechanisms. Okay, so you will see here basically mostly the proteins are absorbed by the process of active transport, but if we have a de-isomers, I am talking about most of them are L as you know, but in cases with minute amount of amino acids which are having a de-isomer, they are transported via simple diffusion. Keep in mind that tri and dipeptides can be actively transported faster compared to the individual amino acids. Some proteins are 
absorbed in an intact form. Examples include immunoglobulins, which are found in cholesterol of the mother's milk, and vaccines. These proteins can be absorbed in an inactive, uh, in an intact form, okay, via the process of endocytosis. Now, once the amino acids and the proteins are absorbed, what happens next then? What is the fate? The amino acids are used for synthesis of protein or synthesis of small peptide biosynthesis. The GSH that you see here stands for glutathione. Okay, glutathione. This is also known. This is also known as the master oxidant of the body. Master oxidant, antioxidant of the body. So the amino acids they can be used to build up this biosynthesis of glutathione. Third role or the third fate is that the non-protein nitrogenous compounds that are formed in the body, for example, ketylene, urea, ammonia, and uric acid. Okay, this can be formed after the amino acids. Number four, deamination and transamination. This can happen to these proteins and amino acids in order to synthesize new amino acids or glucose or even ketone bodies, especially in the state of starvation. See here, sources and fates of amino acids. So, this is an important definition, protein turnover. What basically this means? Basically, the source of protein in our body is dietary protein. Okay? And, so it, def it, it is defined as, break it includes both synthesis and breakdowns of protein molecules. Whatever that is left in balance in between them are known as protein turnover. So, the total amount of protein in body of a healthy adult is constant usually. Because why? Because the synthesis of protein and breakdown of protein is usually equal to maintain a balance. Okay, now let's go into details about what happens with the amino acids with the detailed process after they are digested and absorbed. To be more specific, let's go into details about what happens to the amino group of the amino acids. That we need to know in details. So, you'll see here that the amino group of the amino acids has several fates and several things happens with this amino group so first one it includes the process of deamination so that is the removal of ammonia this removal can be either oxidative deamination or direct deamination under oxidative deaminations, usually uh, it can take place either in peroxisomes or in the mitochondria with specific enzymes. Direct deamination, which is also known as non-oxidative, involves removal of either hydroxyl group or water or removal of the sulfur group. Next thing by which the ammonia can be removed is also known as transamination and transdeamination. So this is one fate of the amino group. The second fate is what will happen to the amino acids in the carbon skeletons. Number three, how the ammonia will be metabolized. Okay, so these three things we need to know. Now let's see what happens with them. First one is deamination of amino acids. So what will basically happen in during this process, the amino group of the amino acids are removed and as it happens, the amino acids gets converted into something called alpha keto acid. So it can happen by several mechanisms. First one that should we should put our focus on is oxidative deamination. Now this first one, the enzyme glutamate dehydrogenase are found in the mitochondria and act as a major deaminase, that is removal of amino group. During this process, the glutamate dehydrogenase converts the glutamate into alpha ketoglutarate and ammonia. For this process to be taking place, ADP is very essential because it will stimulate the process. 
However, it will be inhibited by products like ATP, GTP, NADH, and so on. Therefore, high ATP content okay, will increase protein degradation. High ATP, that is when you are in food, good food status, will decrease the deamination of amino acids. Okay, so basically what is it? If you are well fed, you don't need amount of, you don't need any more uh, the removal of the amino acids when you are well fed state. So this will mainly promote protein synthesis because you have a source of protein. But if you are starving, let's say, okay, in that case is where you have not high amount of ATP, but rather you have high amount of ADP. In those circumstances, it will rather involve breakdown of protein because our body tissues are lacking protein because we are starving. So this may result in that. Number two, the amino acid oxidase. Okay, now this one, amino acid oxidase mainly will take place in paroxysms. The organelle called paroxysms. Okay, usually paroxysm of liver and kidney. So basically what happened here, the L-amino acids, which is the major type of amino acid in us, okay, will get oxidized and will use flavor mononucleotide. Okay, flavor mononucleotide, okay, will get reduced into FMNH2. While if we have D amino acids, they will get oxidized and neutralized flavoadenine dinucleotide FAD. Ultimately, what will happen? The amino acids, the amino acids, amino groups are removed and it gets converted into amino acids and keto acids. Do you guys remember amino acids? It was a pyrrole uh, ring with proline, if you remember. The second mechanism by which the ammonia can be removed, the amine group, is non-oxidative deamination, also known as direct deamination. So basically, the amino acids serine and threonine will go through the process of dehydration, that is removal of water. Okay, directly will remove water and it gets converted into pyruvate and ammonia. The pyruvate that are generated here can easily in enter the carbon skeleton and can either be used for synthesis of ATPs via TCA cycle and so on. Second mechanism under this is known as deamination by desulfahydration. So basically sulfur group or sulfide group are removed from enzyme that also generates pyruvate and ammonia. Okay, third mechanisms and that the fate of amino acid is called transamination. Trans means across and amination means adding of the amino group basically. These reactions are mainly carried out by amino transferases, the enzyme amino transferases. So on the presence of amino acids and keto acids, these enzymes can convert the amino acid into a new amino acids and the keto acids into a new keto acids. These enzymes are basically found both in cytoplasm and in the mitochondria. Okay, that includes aspartate amino transferase, in short we call it AST, and glutamate oxaloacetate transaminase, which in short we call it GOT. Second group includes alanine amino transferase, we call it ALT, and glutamate pyruvate transaminase, GPT. In all of the reactions, the alpha keto glutarate group that we have here act as an acceptor of amino group. So basically the amino group from the amino acids are transferred to this alpha keto glutarate to give rise to a new keto acids and a new amino acids. Okay, most of them can undergo, most amino acids can undergo this process with few exceptions here. As you can see, a lysine, threonine, and amino acids, they usually won't go through these reactions. So this is how the process of transamination takes place. And in order to carry out this process, it's very essential that our body should have vitamin B6, also known as pyridoxine. Why? Because the enzyme amino transferases requires a prosthetic group known as pyridoxal phosphate or PLP. This is derived from our vitamin B6. So in order to in order to take out this or carry out these reactions, the 
presence of PLP is very essential, which is provided by our vitamin B6. So how does this patient occur? First step, you see here the amino group of amino acids will be first transferred to this pyridoxal phosphate. Okay, the amino group will be transferred to this pyridoxal phosphate. Second, what will happen? The alpha keto deuterate, which is known as the universal amino group acceptor. It will react with this pyridoxal phosphate to form glutamate. This whole process is also known as ping pong mechanism. So first, what is happening? The amino acid is transferring its amino group to our pyridoxal phosphate with which the alpha keto glutamate will react to form glutamate. Now, what are the importance of this process of transamination? So it is a very important mechanism by which the amino nitrogen can be exchanged between several molecules without the loss. It's also metabolically important because we don't have any mechanism to store protein or amino acids. So in case we have a low energy, that is when we are starving, okay? So oxidation of the keto acids can be derived from this process. It is also an important reaction through which we can build up non-essential amino acids. Okay, again, non-essential is the one those are made in the body. Now this will happen with our amino acids ultimately here. Number one, amino acids can be just simply degraded into common metabolic intermediates such as pyruvate, alpha ketoglutarate, oxalacetate. And if you have studied already in carbohydrate metabolism in TCA cycle and glycolysis, okay, these intermediates are produced. So ultimately this can help us to generate ATP or reducing equivalent. Second thing that can happen is can they can go through complex degradation. Okay, the amino acids and ketoacids can go through complex degradations. For example, tyrosine, lysine, and tryptophan. Number three is conversion of one amino acid into another amino acid before degradation. So for example, phenylalanine is at first converted into tyrosine before its degradation. So these are basically the fate of all the amino acids in our carbon skeleton. So this is ultimately what happens with the amino acids. Now, once we have known how the metabolism takes place of amino acids and what are the fates, the third important thing that we need to know is how these intermediates can ultimately be used to generate ATP and NADH or reducing equivalent. So as you can see here, alanine, cysteine, glycine, these can ultimately convert into pyruvate, glucose, as you see here, we also can convert into pyruvate Pyruvate ultimately can be converted into oxaloacetate and enter the TCA cycle. Amino acids such as isoleucine, leucine, and tryptophan again can form acetyl coenzyme. Other also can form other intermediates like fumarate, succinyl coenzyme, and so on. So glucogenic amino acids will be used to help us synthesize glucose. The ketogenic will be used to help us synthesize lipids ultimately. And also these can generate NADH and ATPs. Now, see here, metabolism of common intermediates, oxidation. All amino acids can be oxidized through the Krebs cycle for energy production. Some amino acids which are ketogenic can go through fatty acid synthesis, for example, leucine and lysine. Some can go through gluconeogenesis, that is help in the synthesis of glucose especially during the process of starvation. Okay, so this includes glucogenic amino acids such as alanine, serine, glycine, and so on. So you can see here, we have, I've also given here the chart, which are our glucogenic amino acids, which are ketogenic, and which have both the properties. Okay, so now we already know the fate of these amino acids. We already know how these amino acids are being metabolized by the process of deamination, transamination, and so on.